Hey everyone, it's Patrick Morrison, and today I want to talk about airborne biospheres. Carl Sagan had hypothesized that floating organisms could exist on gas giants such as Jupiter. Now, is such a biosphere really possible? To answer this question, we can first look to Earth. At any given time, there are countless bacterial cells floating through the atmosphere. Some environmental microbiologists have argued that the atmosphere has its own microbial ecology. Although many microorganisms are floating around the air at a given time, no microorganism has yet been documented reproducing while airborne. There are a number of reasons to think that microorganisms wouldn't be able to reproduce while in the air. The biggest obstacle is likely the inavailability of predominantly non-volatile elements. The elemental stoichiometry of life is outlined by the Redfield Ratio, which states that for every 106 atoms of carbon found in biomass, there will be 16 nitrogen atoms, one phosphorus atom, and between 0.1 and 0.001 iron atoms. Carbon and nitrogen are plentiful in the air as carbon dioxide and diatomic nitrogen, but iron and phosphorus are extremely rare in the atmosphere. If you look at the observed concentrations of phosphorus and iron in cloud water and the average volume of a cloud water droplet, you'll find out that there could be theoretically enough of these elements for the smallest cells to divide once, but there's still a problem. Most often, when a water droplet forms as part of a cloud, it will condense around a dust particle known as a condensation nuclei, and most of the iron and phosphorus dissolved in cloud water was originally in said condensation nuclei. Meanwhile, if a bacterial cell is in a cloud droplet, it would itself have acted as the condensation nuclei, so there wouldn't have been a source of iron or phosphorus for the cell. So if the atmosphere does act as its own ecosystem, it wouldn't be in the sense that it sustains its own isolated community. Instead, some microorganisms could have an airborne stage in their life cycle, where they float in the air, accumulating carbon as carbohydrates and lipids, and nitrogen as amino acids. Once they land on the ground, they can then accumulate enough non-volatile elements to reproduce. So, in other words, microorganisms can potentially grow or accumulate biomass while airborne, and reproduce, i.e. increase the number of individuals, while on the ground. Although another not so insurmountable obstacle to aerial organisms is the exposure to UV radiation at high altitudes, which might force them to go dormant to survive. It is true that many photosynthetic microorganisms can grow and reproduce on high altitude mountain slopes. However, these microorganisms often secrete a gelatinous layer around a mass of cells known as a biofilm which includes photoprotective pigments to protect the individual microbes from solar radiation. An individual cell in a cloud droplet could not secrete such a biofilm. But what about other planets? Are there conditions that could facilitate the emergence of an airborne biosphere? Well, we could first look at planets with a different set of physical characteristics. If it had the same gravity and atmospheric density as Saturn's moon Titan, with one-sixth Earth's gravity and 1.5 times the atmospheric density of Earth, cloud droplets would have 9 times the width and 729 times the volume of cloud droplets on Earth. Here, smaller cloud droplets, similar in size to those found on Earth, can merge into larger ones without ultimately becoming a raindrop and falling to the surface. The condensation nuclei of some of these droplets can be dust particles, while others could be microorganisms. This would give airborne microbes access to enough poorly volatile elements to allow them to reproduce. The droplet would then evaporate around the daughter cells, allowing them to float freely. Water would then condense around them, and the cycle repeats. Although, one hindrance to such a biosphere would be how often iron and phosphorus 
would go together in a single droplet. Phosphorus is generally more abundant in felsic rocks, which constitute continental crust, while iron is more abundant in mafic rocks, which are found in oceanic crust. So, any cloud droplet with enough phosphorus to facilitate cellular reproduction may not have enough iron and vice versa. One way around this conundrum is to have life with a very fundamentally different biochemistry. It's been hypothesized that high energy thioester bonds could perform similar functions to organophosphate groups in Terran life. In other words, sulfur would substitute phosphorus, the specifics of which is a topic for another video. If any organism had such a biochemistry, it would be easier for them to colonize the atmosphere since it's easier to get sulfur in a gaseous form such as sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide. Would it be possible to have a biochemistry that didn't require iron or other metals? Metals are important catalysts of prebiotic chemistry, but there could be some as of yet undescribed chemical processes that could give rise to life that didn't require metals. However, if the biochemistry of life on a given planet initially used metals, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to evolve out of the need for these metals. The reason I would argue this is the prevalence of iron limitation in the world's oceans. There are large regions of the ocean, found mostly in the Bering Sea and Southern Ocean, known as high nutrient low chlorophyll, or HNLC regions. These have high concentrations of nitrate and phosphate, but have low rates of productivity, as inferred by the concentrations of chlorophyll in the water. The prevailing hypothesis is the low concentrations of iron in these regions limits how much biomass can be produced. Algae, which inhabit these regions, have adaptations that curtail their iron requirements some 100-fold, like using flavins to facilitate redox chemistry but they can't eliminate their need for iron entirely. This makes the notion that an extraterrestrial organism could evolve completely out of the need for iron or other metals quite dubious. That said, there are different planetary chemistries which could better facilitate airborne biospheres. For one, if the atmosphere was more reducing, much of the phosphorus would be in the form of phosphine, which is a gas, negating the phosphorus dilemma. However, metals such as iron are much more difficult to get into a gaseous form, although one volatile iron species that comes to mind is iron pentacarbonyl, and recent experimentation has indicated that it would be released by lava, which originated from a more reducing mantle. Venus is a planet hypothesized to have airborne microorganisms based on anomalous spectral signatures from the clouds and the detection of phosphine in the atmosphere. At some point in the distant past, Venus experienced a mass resurfacing event, which released carbon trapped in the crust as carbonates into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. This in turn caused a runaway greenhouse effect, which literally baked the surface. Any life on the surface would have been scorched, but some astrobiologists argue that it may have found a refuge about 50 kilometers above the surface in the clouds, where the temperatures and pressures are similar to that of Earth at sea level. However, a major problem with this theory is that the clouds of Venus are made up of sulfuric acid. You may have heard that some bacteria live in solution as acidic as battery acid. However, battery acid is mostly water with sulfuric acid dissolved in it. Meanwhile, the droplets in the clouds of Venus are at least 75% sulfuric acid, with most being above 90% sulfuric acid. No bacteria are known to be able to survive in an environment this acidic. But let's say something similar happened in a far-off exoplanet, 
while the clouds were composed of water, and microorganisms overcame the aforementioned limitations. What would the ecology be like? With an atmosphere composed mostly of carbon dioxide, life would likely have to evolve photosynthetic processes to produce organic carbon, and in do so release oxygen. However, this oxygen likely wouldn't accumulate to atmospheric concentration seen on the Earth. This is because oxygen is quite reactive and will oxidize reduced chemicals and rocks originating from lava flows. Should all photosynthesis on Earth come to an end, within about one million years, all the oxygen in the atmosphere would be depleted. The oxygen concentration on Earth can be said to be in a steady state where the rate of production is equal to the rate at which it's consumed. On our hypothetical planet, the rate of airborne photosynthesis would be a tiny fraction of that on the land and sea of Earth, resulting in a much lower steady state concentration. If multicellularity evolved in such an environment, it would likely have evolved under a lighter than air basis. Multicellularity would start off as it did on Earth with a bunch of cells remaining bound to one another. But in an atmospheric environment, this would decrease the surface area to volume ratio, causing the organism to sink more rapidly. One way around this problem would be to fill intracellular components known as vacuoles with a lifting gas such as methane or hydrogen in order to stay afloat. As time moves on, some of the cells on one side of the organism could become specialized with more gas vacuoles than those on the other side. Later, the cells on the lifting side of the organism could instead form a membrane composed of many cells around a bladder filled with a lifting gas. If the mass of an organism was 92 kilograms and hydrogen was used as the lifting gas and the gas bladder was kept at twice the pressure of the surrounding environment, it would have to have a total volume of 50 cubic meters to keep the organism afloat, assuming the atmosphere was composed of carbon dioxide and the pressure at the altitude it lived at was similar to Earth's atmosphere at sea level. If such an organism had a circular shape, the cross section facing the sun would be 16.5 square meters. The insulation of a planet like Venus would be 1,785 watts per square meter at midday. And if we were to assume 6% of the sunlight striking our blimp organism could be converted into cellular energy, it could sustain a maximum metabolic rate of 1,772 watts. The reason we're assuming this conversion efficiency is because plants can convert 6% of the sunlight hitting them into chemical energy. For some perspective, the basal metabolic rate of a human with a similar mass is 121 watts, i.e. there would be enough energy to maintain photosynthesis and the metabolism of a floating organism from sunlight. If you look back to Carl Sagan's presentation, he proposed two kinds of organisms. Floaters, which acted as photosynthetic blimp plants, and hunters, which flew around and consumed the floaters for energy. So, could lighter and heavier than air organisms coexist on a planet with an airborne biosphere? Flight has evolved at least four times on Earth, and each time it used a heavier than air approach. I suspect that given the abundance of faster, sturdier, heavier than air flying predators, any lighter than air organism would be hunted to extinction because it would just be too vulnerable. But on a planet that didn't have a habitable surface, if any aerial predators hunted their floating prey beneath a certain level, they couldn't start hunting alternative terrestrial food sources. Such a selection regime could ensure that at least some of the given species of floating prey can survive. But one hindrance to the evolution of flyers would be the aforementioned low concentrations of oxygen. Looking at Earth's geologic history, 
high concentrations of oxygen seem to be a prerequisite for the evolution of animal-like organisms. However, if the volcanoes of the scorched surface of our hypothetical world release large quantities of water vapor and the planet had a weak magnetosphere, high energy solar particles from the solar wind would interact with water molecules high in the atmosphere. The water molecules would be split and the lighter hydrogen atoms would fly off into space while the heavier oxygen atoms would recombine as diatomic oxygen. What kind of oxygen concentrations this process could give rise to is debated. For more info on this, you can look up abiotic oxygen production. But this nonetheless raises the possibility of heavier than air animal like organisms living in an airborne biosphere. You might think that this would be energetically very expensive. However, condors on Earth can soar for hours without flapping their wings once by riding thermals high in the air and then gliding down until they find another thermal to ride. If instead of having an atmosphere like Venus, our hypothetical planet had a reducing atmosphere and abiotic oxygen production occurred, flying organisms could utilize a different approach to energy production. Here, they could have gill-like structures that took oxygen along with reduced gases such as methane, hydrogen sulfide, and ammonia out of the air. Once in their bloodstream, they could oxidize the reduced gases to fuel their metabolism, essentially being chemosynthetic organisms. They would then expel water vapor, nitrogen, sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide, making them basically a flying mix of whale sharks and tube worms. Phototrophic floating organisms could also evolve in such an atmosphere, but their light-based metabolism would likely work differently than photosynthetic organisms do here on Earth. This is because on our planet, virtually all carbon in the atmosphere is in the form of the oxidized carbon dioxide. So, electrons have to be taken from other elements, such as oxygen in the form of water, to produce organic carbon from it. Meanwhile, on a planet with a more reducing atmosphere, methane can be instead reacted with carbon dioxide to produce organic molecules in the same redox state as most biomass. This would still require an input of energy in the form of light, but it would require less light energy per mass unit of biomass produced. But Sagan spoke of life in the atmosphere of gas giants, so would this really be plausible? Given everything we know about prebiotic chemistry, there's basically no way life could have formed in the atmosphere. So, it would have to be delivered there from one of the nearby Jovian moons. Now, the atmospheres of the gas giants in the solar system are too cold to support life, but this wouldn't be the case if the gas giant was an exoplanet in the habitable zone of its star. Say some airborne microorganisms got into the atmosphere and got around the iron limitation problem. What kind of metabolism would these organisms employ? Well, for one, chemosynthesis would be out of the question. Gas giants have incredibly reducing atmospheres composed mostly of hydrogen with some helium and all the other elements will be in the reduced form, such as methane, hydrogen sulfide, and ammonia. The lack of any oxygen to act as the electron acceptor only leaves phototrophy as a means of energy production. In fact, since all the carbon in the atmosphere would be in the form of methane, any microorganism inhabiting the clouds would likely have to employ a kind of reverse photosynthesis, taking oxygen atoms off water, binding them to the carbon, and releasing the resulting hydrogen atoms into the surrounding environment. But could multicellular life evolve here? Well, without a chemical disequilibria, it's doubtful that heavier-than-air organisms could evolve 
due to the scarcity of available energy. The evolution of lighter than air multicellular organisms would face challenges as well. The lightest lifting gas is hydrogen, and this makes up most of the atmosphere of gas giants as well. In our solar system, the Jovian planet with the greatest concentration of helium in its atmosphere is Neptune at 19%. So, if an airborne organism on a planet with an atmosphere similar to Neptune had a total mass of 16 kilos and a bladder filled with pure hydrogen, the bladder would have to have a volume of 1,003 cubic meters, and if it had a spherical shape, its diameter would be about 12.5 meters. But the gas bag couldn't be held in shape by internal pressure because that would increase the density, making it similar to the surrounding air, causing the organism to sink. Instead, it would need a rigid support structure, similar to an early zeppelin, which would likely comprise much of the 16 kilo total mass. So, multicellular life would have a much more difficult time evolving in the atmosphere of a gas giant than a terrestrial planet. Finally, one proposed scenario for an airborne biosphere is a zero-g environment. In Larry Niven's books The Smoke Ring and The Integral Trees, a neutron star had a gas torus with a part near the center with a gas density and pressure similar to that of Earth at sea level. Here, organisms just floated around in a free-fall environment. The biggest problem I have with this scenario is that since the surface of neutron stars are so hot, any place in the habitable zone would have been inundated with UV light, making such a habit extremely unlikely. All right, well, that's all I have to say about the topic. But if you have something to add or an alternative view, I look forward to reading your comments. Thanks.